Hi guys, welcome to the next discussion video for our Let's Play Fran Bow series. Uh, we're going to be doing a bit of backtracking to um, actually quite a bit back because I, I haven't had the time to um, cut and edit and create a uh, discussion video because it's, it's very, very time consuming. Uh, hopefully I'll be able to get this done um, in one night so it'll be up for you. Um, First thing we're going to do is um, kind of briefly, actually, because I want to get caught up to speed on some of the things that have been happening more recently. We're going to go back to the hospital a little, little bit, and um, I'm going to mention some things that uh, I didn't mention in the last discussion video because they happened right after or so. Um, okay, so one of the first things I wanted to go back to was, I believe, Annabella. Uh, I think that was her name. Um, it was the little girl that had, like, the cuts on her, and, um, she was, I think, the, one of the, she was, like, the first girl that we saw that had, um, a, like, a shadow with her, and, uh, she was the one that had been, like, molested. Um, something that we found out after we saw her as, you know, in the, the nightmare state or whatever, whatever you want to call it, we saw her normally after that. And one of the th things that she says is she can uh, sense the shadows. She says that uh, she can't see them, but she knows that they're there. And that was a really, really important statement so far in the game because we were still trying to figure out, is this all isolated to Fran's mind? Is, is this a completely unique experience to her? Does this have any sense of reality to it whatsoever? And... At this point, her Annabella being able to sense the shadows is basically saying it's not just Fran. Um, that is assuming that, you know, the hospital, it's, hospital itself, Annabella herself, and, you know, what where we were playing the game, assuming that that's all real, right? Um, which I'm kind of going to go off of, because trying to go off of anything other than that at this point would just be wild, wild crazy speculation. Uh, but anyways, so it's kind of making me wonder, does that mean that she has the same ability to see the shadows um, as Fran does? And what I mean by that is, does that mean that this is an ability that some people have? And maybe it has something to do with the pills that they're being given. Um, next, I wanted to say, uh, she said, the, the girl, Annabella, I believe, she said that they tie her up. And, and I was really, really disturbed, but also, like, kind of morbidly intrigued by the wounds that she had on her arms. And, I'm, and I was going back and forth between, does this mean that she was hurting herself? No, that's impossible. She's only seven years old. That doesn't, you know, that can't be the case. And she did say that they tied her up and those are probably from the restraints. It's probably what it is. But if I go back and read the dialogue word for word, she is saying um, they tie her up sometimes and when she tries to draw or when she, when she wants to draw, she can't. Um, and when she can't draw, she hurts herself, and then the red milk flows. So if you look at the if you look at the structure of her sentence and her phraseology there, it makes it pretty darn clear that when she says she hurts herself, that is what the wounds on her arms are from. This is getting a little bit out there, but it makes me wonder if um, self-inflicted harm is some type of defense mechanism or or internal reaction to extreme trauma that isn't influenced by other people around us. So you have to wonder, how did she get the idea to do that? Who who taught her? How did she where did she come up with the idea to hurt herself? And so far in the in the game we haven't seen that anywhere else with any of the other children. And I honestly, honestly don't believe that she did see it from any of the children or from anybody else because that's not a normal thing for a seven-year-old to uh, experience. So, that, like I said, it gets a little bit out there. 
it makes me it makes me kind of wonder and i know that it's probably not anything that um the game was or the developers were trying to address on purpose um but i think it's it's a really interesting uh topic for speculation so that's interesting so uh in the end about annabella i do believe that her wounds were self-inflicted and i wanted to just go over that which if nothing else makes the game way more disturbing yeah way more way more disturbing thinking that you know she did that to herself then that was caused by her restraints next i wanted to talk about um the boy with the exploding head in the tv room um he's going on about some nonsense of paper vision and whatnot at the at the the tv and um, she, he's got a very clear, noticeable scar along his um, scalp. And, I mean, I don't... He's been lobotomized. That's, that's what it is. Especially, the evidence to support that is when we end up in the basement and then we um, see, like, evidence in the basement of them cutting open heads and, like, taking out pieces of brains and stuff like that. So... Um, I'm not gonna think too into the whole paper vision thing. I just think it made him crazy. Um, more importantly though, his shadow and the fact that his brain explodes, his head explodes when, um, you enter the, the nightmare mode or wherever you want to call it. Um, and when Fran looks at it, when Fran looks at his, you know, decapitated body, he's, he, she says something like, they cut your brain into pieces and you know i mean she probably doesn't know that he was lobotomized but you know her saying that is also another um another tip off that you know he was lobotomized and it kind of broke everything and um and you know his brain exploded i think that his head exploded because basically they just they just destroyed his brain they just it's worth nothing now it's crazy um, but going over to the shadows, which sometimes I have a hard time linking what is being said by the shadows to whose shadow it is. Um, for instance, his shadow says, look at me. I saw, uh, I say I care while you're dying of hunger and thirst. Look at me. I say you're beautiful while I give you poison to eat. Look at me. I say I love you while I'm teaching you to hate yourself. And when I think about that, I don't know if I can specifically um, apply that to that child, but those lines make me think of um, deception and manipulation. Um, I think that it's... My first impression is that it's talking about adults uh, to a child. So the adult is the one saying, I care, but also watching or maybe even causing the child to die of hunger and thirst. The, the adult is saying you're beautiful while they're actually feeding you poison. And then, you know, the adult is telling the child, I love you, but I'm teaching you to hate yourself. And that's the manipulation point right there. Um, basically saying one thing and doing another. Mm, so uh, the best example I can think of that is maybe it's the treatment of the staff. Maybe it's what the staff pretends to be doing, you know, from the perspective of the outside world looking at, you know, the hospital. But what they're doing on the inside is really, really terrible. So that's about, you know, deception and manipulation and, you know, pretending and saying that you're, you know, you really care, but you're really doing some awful things to them. As far as the girl who appears to be lying, maybe possibly dead, on the couch, um, Fran says that she's sedated, and when you look at her under the influence of the pills, she's a skeleton, and I, I think, I think Fran might say something that she's dead or something like that, um, and, but then, like, there's a shadow that's kind of, like, cradling her or, or whatever and petting her, um, so I was thinking about that. I was wondering if maybe, maybe even just in her case, like being a skeleton was kind of representing the state of her, uh, her soul, maybe. So being heavily, heavily sedated, 
maybe um, her being a skeleton and dead is kind of trying to say she's dead on the inside because of the sedation or or maybe it's even she's dead on the inside because the shadow which is cradling her has already taken her has already done its horrible thing and now I don't want to jump too far ahead um, to where we're at now but I figured this would be a really good point to talk a little bit more about Mr. Midnight um, because there were a couple of things uh, when we're trying to escape the hospital we see this little mechanical toy thing of Mr. Midnight and it looks really really creepy as hell and then again when we actually get out of the hospital um, you, you know the the head demon or whatever he is uh, comes out the door and tries to drag her back in and here comes along this little whirring um, you know mechanical toy of Mr. Midnight and for some reason it drives the, the monster away it drives the demon away and I, I've seen some of the comments and I've actually seen uh, quite a few people who think that um, Mr. Midnight may not be the benevolent companion that we think he is um specifically because of that point you know it's very suspicious like why in the world would that you know head demon monster be intimidated by mr midnight well could it be because he's on their side could it be that mr midnight is more more powerful and more evil well i can't say you know anything for sure as of right now but my opinion so far my stance is that mr midnight is probably probably the only good positive force that's on our side um helping us fight the darkness and you know basically on fran's team and i think that the fact that the um demon was frightened by mr midnight was because uh darkness fears light and um in Mr. Midnight is maybe a positive energy so powerful that he feared it or ran away or or whatever. I, I don't know. Some ideas, some just throwing some out here would be but the power of love, maybe. I don't know. Or maybe Mr. Midnight is something very, very special, but um, maybe the light equivalent to what the head demon is for darkness if you if there's this war between light and dark which kind of looks like they're alluding to later on with the journal and whatnot maybe even good versus evil so if we have um you know the big giant goat demon who's leading the the evil team then maybe mr midnight is leading the team of you know good or at least on the side of good so that's why I think Mr. Midnight is great, and I love him. And if he ends up being an antagonist and, like, super crazy plot twist, I'm going to be not only furious, but I'm also going to be pretty disappointed. Um, but I don't want to even, you know, talk too much about, you know, endings and whatnot right now. I don't think we have enough information. Okay, so that is going to wrap up the discussion for this uh, video in particular. I know that we still have a lot to cover to get caught up to where we are now. What I'm going to do is hold off on the whole Ithersta um, topic until Ithersta is done. Uh, maybe I'll talk a little bit about what I think while it's going on, but we're not going to get there just yet. So my next discussion video is going to be covering us escaping from the hospital up to the point of entering a Thursta. If there's anything in particular that you want me to address or any questions that you have, leave them below. I will definitely be checking them and I'll try to add it into the discussion for the next video, which is probably going to be either right after this one, since my headset is out of commission, commission and I only have a microphone, or if not, if I get a new headset working or, or something and I feel like it, I might just do another let's play video and then do the discussion after. After people have had a little bit of time to watch this and add their questions and comments below, okay? Well, really glad that you guys joined me for the discussion. You guys are amazing. I'll see you next time.